the scouters say about it? Sustained TDP limit. It's over. Thirty. What? Thirty. There's no way that can be right. Can it? I think it's right. After all, I was trained in the art of overclocking. Hey everyone, in this video we'll be demonstrating how to overclock and tweak your RGL by using a program called Universal X86 Tuning Utility Handheld, developed by James CJ60. However, it's important to note that overclocking can potentially void your warranty and may cause instability or damage to your device if not done properly. Proceed at your own risk and make sure to thoroughly understand the risks involved before attempting anything. To begin, you can find the download link in the program in the video description below. Make sure you download the latest beta version from the Variety website. However, since this is a beta program, uh, be aware you might find some bugs or stability issues. Exercise caution when using it and consider backing up anything important before using it. Once you've downloaded the program, installation should be straightforward. However, keep in mind the program requires Microsoft.NET Framework. So make sure you have this installed in your system beforehand, and if not, it will auto-install on first launch. Upon launching the program, you can access the menu by pressing LB and RB and up on the D-pad simultaneously. It's worth mentioning that the user interface of the program may not be the most user-friendly, and I wish I could have set up my own like, like hotkeys. As we explore the available options, you'll find features such as connectivity settings, volume, and brightness controls, as well as the ability to configure the program to start at Windows boot or minimized. Uh, when these settings are not really in related to overclocking, uh, just keep in mind that you can turn them off and on and these ones won't cause any issues for you. As well, you can control your actual like ROG profile in there as well from turbo, uh, silent and performance. Now, moving over to the advanced tab, you'll come across options like temperature limit and power limit. It's crucial to exercise caution when adjusting these settings. Pushing the temperature limit beyond the recommended threshold uh, of 95 degrees may result in increased heat generation, potential thermal throttling or even hardware damage. Similarly, with respect to power limit, as exceeding the safe limits can lead to instability, crashes, or even permanent damage to your device. However, in my testing, the APU will not go past 43 sustained. Even still, this is outside of the manufacturer spec. So just be use caution. Um, another feature provided is the curve optimizer, which allows you to undervolt the CPU. Undervolting can be a useful technique to reduce power consumption and heat generation, but it requires a careful adjusting and testing. It's important to note that undervolting may not always yield significant improvements in performance and can potentially introduce system instability or crashes, if done improperly. Be prepared to experiment and fine-tune with the settings to find the optimal balance between performance and stability. I recommend using Haven Benchmark in the background and then make adjustments as you can see fit there and just watch for any uh, graphical artifacting or anything weird with your system. Um, as for example, my desktop 7900X can boost up the 5.5 all-core after my PBO tweaking, which is the same as core optimizer, from a 5.1 all-core load with no increase to temperatures. As well, you'll see in my benchmarks, they're all completed with a negative 20 offset. The max CPU clock speed option will allow you to set your desired speed for your CPU. However, it's important to manage your expectations here. While you can set a higher clock speed, there's no guarantee that your device will ever reach that speed, as it depends on various factors such as cooling, power delivery, and silicon quality. Setting unrealistic or excessive clock speeds can lead to instability or crashes. Additionally, the max CPU count option will allow you to park cores, which can help preserve power when running less demanding tasks. However, keep in mind that disabling cores can impact overall performance in multi-threaded workloads, so consider your specific usage case scenarios before making adjustments. This may be helpful in emulation. RTSS is Rubia Tuner Statistics Server. This is a frame rate monitor software that typically is tied in with MSI Afterburner. You'll have to download this, but once it's installed, you'll be able to set an FPS limiter uh, in-game, not like the Allies option of have to set the FPS limit before starting your game. You'll also want to set RTSS to launch at Windows as well. Another intriguing feature is the adaptive frame rate, which will allow you to set an upper and lower limit to, as mentioned before, and then this in conjunction with the APU limit can be used to help maintain a better TDP, similar to the auto TDP software that we've seen out there. For instance, you can set a lower of 30 and an upper of 40, and then it'll kind of play within those bounds. Uh, when when lo bigger dips are happening, it'll obviously kick up the wattage. For energy performance preference, when set to zero, the energy performance preference register is programmed to favor performance. When set to 100, the energy performance preference is set to 255 to favor energy settings. The default is 25%, however, if you want maximum performance, change this down to zero, or you can leave it turned off. 
Lastly, the iGPU clock setting allows you to adjust the clock speeds of your integrated GPU. This can be useful for fine-tuning graphics performance, but be aware that pushing clock speeds too high may result in instability, graphical glitches, or overheating. Take small incremental steps when adjusting the setting and monitor your system for any adverse effects such as artifacts or whatever. Um, this option would be especially useful for emulation as forcing a lower clock speed of like 800 to 1000 megahertz will yield better results in emulation for Switch it, for example. With all these options understood, what does that mean for us? Not a whole lot, unfortunately, as you'll see in my benchmarks. Going into performance, each game was run three times at 1080p, both a 30 watt and 43 watt. Um, as I figured, most people would be using this in an overclock kind of scenario. They would either be plugged in or docked, thus wanting to maximize clarity and fidelity. Settings will be rolling in the corner for each game. 43 watt mode was also run with a negative 20 offset. Starting off with Cyberpunk, we can see that with a 30 watt TDP, we are getting an FPS average of 47.6 with a 1% low and 0.1% low at 26 and 11.6 respectively. Turning it up to 43 watt, we can see we barely gained an over, or a single FPS difference in the averages. However, the lows were brought up by a fair bit and the 1% low is now hitting 30 FPS, which is ideally where you want to be in game. When you see the frame time graph in the top and left corner, uh, that would be the frame time delivery, so that's the perceived smoothness of your game. Getting into Gears 5, again, we did not see much of improvement in overall FPS averages, but the 1% and especially 0.1% lows were brought up significantly. This is a huge boost of perceived smoothness. We're beginning to see a little bit of pattern here, however, I'll let you know a little pattern at the end. Uh, back in Arkham Knight, however, brought us little to no performance difference between the two modes. Moving quickly over to Modern Warfare 2, we can see for the first time that we do have an actual FPS boost to the overall averages, as well as the 1% lows. Again, starting to form a little bit of an opinion here, but we'll keep it to the end. Finally, we have Borderlands 3 again with no noticeable difference, except for the 0.1% lows. Having the ally set to the 43 watt mode, we can see that there was an over 10 FPS difference compared to the 30 watt mode. Now for my final slide, I retested Borderlands 3, three times again, both at 30 and 43 watt mode. However, this time I was lowering resolution to 720p. The reason for this was that we can see from the benchmark results that no matter what, at 1080p, we are GPU bound most of the time. Um, <clears throat> with the ex uh, exception of Modern Warfare 2. So, and that was only because I had everything set to all low. So at that point, it's not a very VRAM heavy game. As for Borderlands 3 at 720p, we actually did gain an overall FPS boost while having 0.1% lows that, that were better. Where does that leave everything? In the moments that you're near an outlet or you would be docking your ally, these would be the times that you'd want to overclock it to get the most performance out of it possible. However, it only really becomes a viable option at 720p or in less VRAM heavy games like competitive shooters. When we make ourselves become CPU bound, we can see an actual performance increase. Putting out frames is a CPU intensive task, while generating said frames is a task of the GPU. If you're GPU bound, your CPU will be under less stress, and however, with your CPU bound, GPU will be under less stress. Uh, to deliver frames quickly, you will need a fast CPU core clock, with the Z1 Extreme going up to 5.1 GHz, although oftentimes it will never hit this, unless we introduce more power. While overclocked and even undervolted at the same time, you should see a performance increase, no matter how slight. You'll also see that CPU is boosting higher as a result, which in layman's terms, can make things go faster. I referenced my earlier example of my 7900X on my desktop being on a PBO offset of negative 20 per core. This will send less voltage to the cores, in turn producing less heat and letting the CPU boost higher and longer. The other benefit of this program is having a working FPS limiter, as well as being able to set an adaptive one based on the lower and upper limit, again similar to Auto TDP. There are drawbacks, however. This is currently in beta, and as such, there are bugs. Over the course of the week of me testing it, my most common bugs and annoyances were if you set the GPU clock speed, it never seemed to go away when you untoggle it. Even closing the program did not fix this. Only a full system restart would fix it. Another issue I found is that the TDP limit, when you have it set in a manual sustained, it will drop back down to 30 watts, and then not go back up to what you have it set to. This is fixed by opening the menu back up, going to your power limit and dropping it below 30, letting it settle in, and then turning it back up to your desired level. As well, not every game plays nice with the pop-up window. Sometimes you'll find yourself having to go to the desktop to access it. A small gripe is not being able to access your uh, 
menu with whatever toggle button you want. Again, it's a very small gripe though. In the end, would I recommend you do this with your alloy? Yes and no. I would say yes for the tweakers out there that would have been doing something like this already, as it should only be getting better over time. However, for people that aren't sure, you can potentially damage your device if you are not careful. When using this program, you must set a manual fan curve by doing so the traditional way in Armory Crate. Unfortunately, you cannot set one through the app at this time, and while I'm no legal expert, uh, this most definitely would violate your warranty if any damages were to come from it. So please use this at your own risk. I have been using it for the greater part of a week with no issues outside of the bugs I mentioned. However, I'm the type of person who would be doing this sort of stuff anyway. My recommendations to this app is to use GPU limiter for emulation as this will boost performance. As well, overclocking your TDP for emulation would be another help. Use the auto TDP like function if you desire, and you could set your max wattage to 25 or 30 and have your FPS limit to 40 to 60. And this would help with battery life and performance dips and drops as shown in Spider-Man here. Overclocking and tweaking your ally can offer potential performance benefits, but it's essential to proceed with caution as it carries inherent risks. Make sure to thoroughly understand the implications, follow proper guidelines, and experiment responsibly to achieve the best results without compromising the stability and longevity of your device. However, with all that being said, that'll do it for this video. Um, if you guys have any recommendations or any other programs you want me to check out, I will be doing another video on Auto TDP and other similar programs. Um, but yeah, let me know if you guys are going to use this in the comments. Let me know your use case for it, if you're going to play games with it or what. <laughs> Who knows? Who knows, right? Uh, but anyway, as always, I hope you all have a great day.